This film is about possibly the most blatant example of institutionalised police corruption that you will ever witness and shows an utter contempt for the rule of law by the police themselves. The City of London is probably the wealthiest square mile on the planet and this wealth, as we've seen through the whole News International debacle, has a corrosive effect on the basics of our democracy. The perversion created by this extreme wealth and power is well illustrated by the corruption of one of our most revered institutions, the Metropolitan Police, and their complicity with the huge Murdoch Corporation. Down the road from Scotland Yard, we have another bastion of democracy, the City of London Police, who we will show have serious fundamental accountability problems of their own to address. Ian Puddock, a successful plumber and his wife, have a story that, unless we had documentary proof, would seem like something from the pen of a crime writer. In fact, it's stranger than fiction. You couldn't make it up. It all started back in May 2009 when a text message arrived on Ian's wife's mobile, whilst Lena was out of the room, from a Tim Haynes, a board member of a major city-based reinsurance corporation for which she had been working for the previous 12 years. To his horror, the text reminisced over a steamy sex session from the previous day and portrayed Haynes masturbating in his bathroom. Ian was truly devastated, but resolved to repair his marriage. Remarkable levels of maturity enabled them to reconcile, but Ian's demands for an apology from this man were greeted by strenuous denials and then, most mysteriously, by shocking levels of abuse. Mystified and frustrated, Ian called Haynes's boss to have Lena moved and then decided to call it a day and move on. If only things had been that simple. About two weeks after this upheaval in their lives, an extraordinary event happened, something which defies belief. They were woken about six in the morning by a loud banging on their front door to discover about 13 armed anti-terrorist police demanding entry. Ian immediately thought this must be a mistake, a case of mistaken identity. But to his horror, they charged in and ransacked his house, removing all his computers and phones. And Ian was then arrested and charged with harassment and taken to Bishopsgate High Security Police Station. Ian declined a lawyer, believing he could explain in simple terms you know, the mistake, what had happened. In effect, virtually nothing. He was bailed and a month later, Ian was asked to attend Snow Hill Police Station. Detective Sergeant John Ellis then took Ian through for another interview. Ian was not read his rights or cautioned on this occasion. Ian asked for a solicitor, but was told he didn't need one. The interview was not recorded. The officers made no notes. Detective Sergeant Ellis then brutalised Ian and accused him of being a drug dealer, screaming into his face that he had conspired to pervert the course of justice and charged with non-violent harassment, which was explained to Ian as an act of terrorism, for which he could spend a substantial period in prison. The gratuitous abuse Ian suffered that day at the hands of these thugs masquerading as police officers, incensed him and inspired him to expose this flagrant wrong, particularly as Ian has never done anything wrong in his life. He's had a few parking tickets and that's about it. The terrorism directorate simultaneously raided his business offices and those of his new accountants, informing them that Ian was a drug dealer and a bankrupt and confiscating more computers, sat-navs and mobile phones, etc for forensics analysis by a specialist high-tech crimes laboratory. Ian and Lena, for the next two years, had their lives turned upside down. Since the initial raids, Ian has been arrested five times, has been to court on numerous occasions, has been accused of drug dealing and conspired to pervert the course of justice, has been followed, had his phone tapped, had his home bugged, 
He's been burgled and had all his court defense documents stolen. His car has been tracked by satellite. He's been harassed and abused by the police who must have spent millions and millions of pounds and all because of an affair. This important city Mandarin was embarrassed or rather as it has now become evident, the company for which he worked stood to lose money on their share value. Were Haynes found guilty of malpractice? Were this not so serious, this whole business would seem farcical. It's completely disproportionate and a terrible waste of public money and almost unprecedented abuse of power. And what makes it worse is that it has since transpired that the West Sussex Constabulary, to whom Haynes had initially reported Ian for harassment, told the City of London Police there was no case to answer. It was at worst a civil case but they crashed on regardless, hell-bent on their attempt to destroy Ian, in an attempt to keep him quiet. But what is unique to this case is the paper trail. We know that Haynes' employers, Guy Carpenters, the reinsurance brokers, instructed a private investigation company, Kroll, the same company used by the Murdoch Empire to phone tap and intimidate, to get Ian. Guy Carpenter, a firm of great reputation, became enthusiastic and used their connections with Kroll, who used their connections with City of London Police, and this was a prosecution out of control. Interesting, the managing director of Kroll informed Guy Carpenter in an email that they had contacts within the City of London Police who confirmed in writing that they would throw, in inverted commas, considerable resources at the matter, including the use of counter-terrorism directorate. Subsequently, the managing director of Kroll called Ian and told him he would be fucked like he'd never been fucked before, and that they had very, very deep pockets. What's very interesting in this case is that Kroll effectively took control of the prosecution. They were sending emails to the police suggesting what step they should take next. We know the names of nearly all the players, all but the top policemen and women who were involved, exposing the power of an American corporation over a British police force, supposedly servants of the British public. This was a malicious, false prosecution and it's a shameful waste of scarce resources. But more importantly, it's a shocking breach of Ian and Lena's human rights by the state. In spite of the shame that was levelled at the City of London Police by the presiding magistrate for their breathtaking perjury during the first prosecution, they still proceeded with another totally bogus prosecution of a man they knew was completely innocent and which must have cost millions and millions of pounds these people seem to inhabit a different world, a world where the rule of law doesn't apply. Most of the freedom of information requests we have made have been denied on the basis of costs. They can waste millions on bogus prosecutions, but when we ask how much that costs, we are told that the information would cost too much to discover. The Freedom of Information Act was introduced to ensure public bodies are accountable. These people need to be accountable. We asked very reasonable questions like, who authorised this raid and how much did it cost? Who informed the local member of parliament about this raid the night before it happened? Who requested and who declined the helicopter support? And why on earth would you require a helicopter? Who requested armed support? This matter has now been the subject of a parliamentary debate. I struggled to find anyone on the prosecution side who was credible. 